Earlier today, defendant Nicholas Jordan was in court for a preliminary hearing. You may recall, he is accused of shooting and killing his roommate, Samuel Knopp, and his roommate's friend on February 16th at the University of Colorado in Colorado Springs. A third roommate told police that one month before that shooting, Jordan threatened to kill Knopp after Knopp asked him to take out the trash. We want to take you back into that hearing that happened earlier today. Good morning. Please be seated. The court is called to order. We are together on 24 CR 753. So we have Mr. Vaughn and Mr. Wood for the people, Mr. Rogers and Mr. Patrick. Yes, Judge. Mr. Patrick. Uh, for uh, Mr. Jordan, Mr. Jordan is present. Good morning, Mr. Jordan. So, since the last time we were together, I have received the uh, evaluation from the state hospital that was uh, filed with the court on April 8th. I have also received the people's request for a, a second competency evaluation. The initial recommendation being that I find that Mr. Jordan is incompetent to proceed. The people have filed a timely request for a second competency evaluation. So it seems to me the next step is to set the matter uh, for review after about 35 days. The statute provides 35 days for the second evaluation. Does that make sense to everybody, Mr. Vaughn? Uh, it does, Your Honor. I'm just curious if the court has found my alternative proposed court order that was filed earlier today. I have a hard copy of the court hasn't. It incorporates sort of my discussion with um, my uh, my doctor who I've hired to do the second competency evaluation. No, I have not seen that. So that just, approach, just, uh, did you file electronically? I did, yes, Your Honor. Uh, let me see if I can find it here first. for a second evaluation, it looks like a proposed order. Um, oh, I see, the proposed order is specifically for me to appoint Dr. Patricia Westmoreland. That's the uh, amended order that you're referring to? It is, Your Honor, and if you'd read on, um, in consultation with uh, uh, Dr. Westmoreland, it's, it makes it easier uh, if the court specifically orders her access to the state hospital records, Your Honor. So I put in there some of the specific requests I have from the state hospital for their records, specifically records relied upon by the uh, state hospital um, evaluator. Um, there's records from Stone Creek Center, uh, records from um, the defendant's attorney's emails to her, um, as well as the raw data to any tests the state hospital ran. Um, although I put a disclaimer for those records, Your Honor, that they are to be directly released to Dr. Westmoreland, because the state hospital objects to the release of that out in normal discovery. They'll only release it to another professional because it contains proprietary information that only their professionals in their field are allowed to have. Everything in the house I'm asking be released to the prosecution to put out in normal discovery. I apologize for the uh, late release, but the prosecution was doing our due diligence to try to get a doctor on board hired right away and figure out what she needs. Mr. Rogers, any objection to the proposed order? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, for a number of reasons. Um, so the the defense understands what they are requesting and reviewed it prior to coming into the, our appearance today. Um, first off, the district attorney's office is not entitled to a doctor of their own choosing. The only statutory provision that provides for that 
is second evaluation at the request of the defendant, not the request of the prosecution or another party. Uh, further, the district attorney's office is not entitled to this information. If it is released, the, the court is going to order all this information released that it's being requested. Then only Dr. Westmoreland should have it. Um, further, the court's going to order that all of the information be disclosed to Dr. Westmoreland. Then the defense is not asking for a protective order, uh, prohibiting the DA from access to these documents, prohibiting the DA from, uh, rather prohibiting Dr. Westmoreland from talking about the materials with the prosecution and prohibiting disclosing the documents to the DA's office or communicating with the DA's office regarding their content. Well, what, is it? What, what materials are you talking about? So they requested a number of materials. Um, it's quite lengthy. Well, not quite lengthy. It's about a page. Um, but it's the entire file from Office of Civil and Forensic Mental Health, all documents, observation logs, handwritten notes, testing working files, and any video and audio that were created by obtained by, reviewed by, or relied by on, on any evaluator. And are, and so uh, are, aren't they entitled to that now? Not the district attorney's office, Your Honor. And I believe there's a scope to the waiver of um, what my client has waived his confidentiality for as well. Um, what the statute provides that the evaluator is entitled to this material, not that the district attorney's office is. Uh, there's no statutory provision that provides for that. The only thing that there's any kind of requirement is sending of collateral materials, but collateral materials is not the same thing. It means the relevant police incident reports, the charging documents, either the criminal information or the indictment. And then further, um, the defense can test the scope of the waiver uh, the DAs are treating this as a full-fledged waiver of confidentiality. However, the waiver is narrowed. They're not entitled to emails from the defense, records from other entities, and not all documents created by, obtained by, reviewed by, or relied upon. The statute says documents used by evaluator, not those that are created by or obtained by. So the, essentially, Your Honor, to put it, to summarize, the, the district attorney's office is being overbroad in the request for information both in what can be provided and specifically what the district attorney's office has access to. There's no statutory provision for what they are asking for, and the defense is asking that the court deny the request that the materials be sent to the district attorney's office, and instead, if the court deems it um, appropriate to disclose, that it only be disclosed to Dr. Westmoreland. example, emails that your office provided to the initial evaluator, that would be provided to um, the district attorney. It's the defense's position that it should not be, um, just in the sense that there's nothing that outlines specifically that should be provided. I would note that emails specifically from the defense to Dr. Fellers um, should not be uh, some kind of it's disclosed to the prosecution. We're not at a hearing state yet. There's not evidence that is being um, prohibited from somebody else. And even in that regard, it deals with Mr. Jordan's rights and not the rights of the prosecution. Hmm. All right. Uh, Mr. Vaughn, uh, why, why aren't the purposes of the statute accomplished by having all these materials provided directly to the evaluator versus through your office. Well, why should my order at this point be that uh, all the information Dr. Belzor used in her evaluation be provided to the new evaluator? Um, Judge, I think I'm entitled to this information regardless if I have an evaluator or not. I'm looking at it just from the perspective of effective cross-examination of the state hospital's doctor, Your Honor. I'm entitled to everything that she has relied upon in forming her opinion. 
So I could ask for a hearing right now without the second evaluation, go to a hearing, and I would be entitled to that information to cross-examine the state uh, doctor. So I don't think my evaluator really comes into the equation other than I should be allowed to provide the documents that I have to her under 16-8.5-104, which deals with the waiver of privilege for women defendant raises competency. It's clear. It says women defendant raises the issue of competency. He waives all privileges, um, and it's not. They do not limit the scope of it. It's a waiver of privilege, Your Honor, when he uh, raises it. And I'm not. I don't believe my request is overly broad. I'm not asking for. Um, any documents that weren't relied upon by the state hospital. I'm not asking for any documents that weren't created by the state hospital. It's very narrow, and it's focused only at the file that is in existence at the state hospital that was created because the evaluator did a competency evaluation. So what would be the purpose of having that information uh, apart from uh, potentially cross-examining uh, the evaluators in the realm of my my topics about uh, evaluators she would need to have it to form her opinion no I know okay. so, let me be more precise in my question I don't have uh, I'm not concerned with regard to all the information that dr. Belser has being provided to uh, the new or the evaluator that you all have proposed, Patricia Westmoreland. I'm, I'm going to order that. The question is whether it come, any of that information comes to your office at this time. And what seems to me to make the most sense is that the all the evaluation file that Dr. Vels are used will be transferred to Dr. Westmoreland. And if we get to the point where you believe you need to have a hearing or cross-examine either of the two evaluators, then I would grant you access to the information, both sides to the information, so that you could effectively prepare for that for that hearing. Does that make sense? It does, Your Honor, with the caveat of, I think, the defense attorney took it a step further and then wants a protective order to where I can't even have a discussion with Patricia Westmoreland about some of the documents that she received. I think the court's plan is a good plan, um, but I need to have a candid conversation with my expert to whether I want to request the hearing, and I don't know how to do that without violating the court's order if the court orders that she can't discuss any of the information she saw in the state hospital's file with me. That wouldn't be a productive conversation. Yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't think that's what you were asking for. What was it, Mr. Rogers? Your Honor, uh, what the defense is asking for is in a sense what Mr. Bond stated and that we're asking that uh, Dr. Westmore will be prohibited from talking specifically about the contents of the documents that the court is not ordering to be disclosed to the prosecution. Uh, namely because if there's communications with the doctor, that is essentially just a workaround to the court's order that they not be provided access to that materials. Mr. Vaughn's argument is that if he wants to talk to his doctor about you know, potentially preparing for a hearing, then we're in the realm that the court just discussed that we'd be in a hearing, the court may be willing to revise its order in regards to material that we had for cross-examination, but I don't think we are at that step yet. If the prosecution wants to go down that road, then they don't also get a second evaluation. They have to elect one or the other. So at this point, that is the request of the defense to prohibit that. I don't understand your election argument. All right, we need to take a break. We're going to get back into this hearing. But just so you know, there are four different items being uh, really asked for at this hearing. The one they're talking about right now, the state wants a second competency evaluation of the defendant. The first one said he was not competent. And they're also asking in order to do that, that they have a lot of his private information about the first evaluation that was done. We're going to leave it there. When we come back, we'll get into more of those arguments. Well, welcome.
Welcome back to Court TV Live. I'm Ashley Wilcott. Thank you so much for joining us. We are bringing you today's hearing in the dorm room double murder trial. Nicholas Jordan, the defendant, is accused of shooting and killing his roommate, Samuel Knopp, and his roommate's friend on January, excuse me, February 16th at the University of Colorado at Colorado Springs. The friend's name, Celie Montgomery. The judge is hearing arguments about Jordan's competency evaluation and about whether he will be allowed to wear civilian clothes when he is tried. Let's go back into court for more of the arguments. It says that, oh, sorry, 1683. It states that either party may ask for a hearing or a second evaluation. <coughs> and further, the next subsection, 1034, says it more explicitly. If a party requests a second evaluation, any pending request for a hearing must be continued until receipt of the second evaluation. So in the prosecution's request, they're asking for both a hearing and for a second evaluation in their motion. I'm not sure if that's being changed today as far as what they're orally requesting. And then also, Your Honor, I, I say this to put it in the posture of what the court just orders uh, is, is uh, mulling over in the sense of providing, providing that information to both parties when and if there's a hearing for competency. All right, so I'm looking at the second paragraph of the people's motion, uh, and it does say a request for a hearing and a second competency evaluation. So it seems to me the statutory scheme is that at this point I order a second competency evaluation and then you all decide if you have a hearing. Isn't that the right procedure? Uh, it is, Your Honor, mostly academic because I can't imagine a situation regardless of what Patricia Westmoreland comes up with that I wouldn't ask for a hearing, but I agree with the court is saying the statutory scheme does seem to put you know, the, the second evaluation before the hearing. Yeah, okay, so, that's all right. so, so that, that I understand. Now, um, okay, Mr. Rogers, anything else? Just uh, the final note, and I'm not sure, I don't think the court has addressed it, that's in regards to the selection um, of the, yes, of the private evaluation. Right, I have it, right. Okay. So and what, was, would you, what would you propose uh, I do? That the, court, uh, that the court do what it did with the first evaluation, assign it to the state hospital or assign it to a doctor that's appointed by the state as opposed to an evaluator that we have chosen. So when the defense requests a second evaluation, I don't go to the state hospital usually. I listen to who you want. Is right. that right? That is correct, Your Honor. Is there a different statu statutory scheme for the prosecution? There's a specific statutory scheme for the defendant, wherein if the defendant requests a second evaluation, they can uh, request what evaluator they have. There is not a provision specifically for the prosecution or any other party that says they can use the evaluator of their own choice. Hmm. Okay. So on the selection, Mr. Vaughn, of who should be doing this second evaluation, uh, I want to hear what you have to say about Mr. Rogers' argument that uh, you don't have the um, right privilege to <coughs> pick the second evaluator. Obviously, I disagree with that, Your Honor, and I think you can look at the statute I, I, I cited for the second competency evaluation. It does contemplate individual parties asking for the evaluation. For example, it says if the court asks for the evaluation, then the court must pay for the evaluation. So right. all, any one of the three of us can ask for a second evaluation. If the court asks for it, the court has to pay it. That's what it says in there. I can't imagine a situation where I have to pay for an evaluation with an evaluator that I don't get to choose, Your Honor. So I think it's, it's implied in the statute, just based on how it's written, that if I ask for the evaluator, then I get to pick the evaluator if I have to pay for the evaluator. Well, Still with us, constitutional attorney Chris Ann Hall. All right, Chris Ann, let's talk about the reality of you have a defendant who's had one competency evaluation, incompetent, meaning he can't assist in his defense. He wouldn't be able to proceed. Now the state right. says we want a second evaluation. How do you feel about asking for another evaluation of the same defendant? 
Well, it's absolutely the way things should work. Remember, there's a due process here that has to be considered. And you don't go with an evaluation for incompetency based on one doctor you have to have a second opinion. And what really happens is, as the prosecution says, and this is the way it is all over the country, who asks for the evaluation, pays for the evaluation, they assign the doctor. So if the second evaluation comes back in conflict of the first evaluation, so the first evaluation said, he's incompetent, the second evaluation says no, he's competent, that's when the court, as the prosecutor said, it depends on who asks for it, then the court has to ask for a third evaluation as a tiebreaker. I don't mean to make light of the situation, but that's really how it works. And it's the only way that the court and the victims in this case and the defendant in this case can have, be assured that all due process has been secured. And let me ask you about the other part of the state's request, and that is information from the first competency evaluation from the doctors be provided to the second evaluator and the state. I understand why it would be um, beneficial for the new evaluator or second evaluator to have that information, but I cannot imagine any reason why the district attorney's office should or would be entitled to that defendant's information. They get the final report, but I don't know that they should get all the um, content behind it that has to do with the health of the defendant. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you on that. The prosecution should only get what's available to them for discovery, and that's it. I would also probably object to the second evaluator having the evaluation from the first evaluation evaluator. And that would be because we need to have a clearly independent second evalu evaluation. Not somebody that's trying to disprove the first or, or trying to become in line with the first. Somebody who's addressing the situation, addressing the interview with the defendant as a purely clean slate to make an independent assessment. Yeah, that's a really great point. And we're going to take a break, but you don't want to miss because another thing that's being asked, an actual motion for the defendant to appear in civilian clothes. Why on earth wouldn't he appear in civilian clothes during that trial in front of a jury? Stay tuned. We'll get you back into court to hear those arguments. We are underway in the trial of doomsday prophet Chad Daybell. Prosecutors say they will seek the death penalty against him. Investigators have recovered human remains at Chad Daybell's residence. There's no way, Lori, and I should never come up with this. His wife, Lori Vallow Daybell, has already been convicted. Now, will her husband end up with the same fate? It's just so hard to know where the truth ends. It's the doomsday prophet, Chad Daybell, on trial. bringing you a hearing for the dorm room double murder trial. Nicholas Jordan is accused of shooting and killing his roommate and his roommate's friend, Celie Rain Montgomery, in February at the University of Colorado at Colorado Springs. Let's get you back into court now for more of the argument and the judge's ruling. Thanks. Commence our proceedings all the way throughout. And I think that would be the distinguishing factor between having a jury um, and or appearing like that in front of a jury and appearing like that in front of the national media. All right. The issue before me is the request by the defendant that he uh, not appear in the orange show uniform for any of the pretrial proceedings. It is clear that it would be inappropriate to have the defendant appear in front of a jury in the orange jail uh, uniform. But I have been unable to find, as the defense just confirmed, any case where that trial right is extended to pretrial proceedings. The importance of the defendant not appearing uh, in custody in front of a jury is, uh, is obvious and well supported in the appellate decisions. The expansion of that um, right to pretrial proceedings uh, is not something that I'm going to adopt. I don't adopt 
uh, that expansion uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, the first, although not most important, but the first is, of course, the administrative burden is placed on the jail and going through the dressing up procedure that Commander might not just explain uh, to the court. But more importantly, and uh, convincing in my decision, uh, are the safety concerns outlined by Commander Minot. Paramount to those is the escape risk and the fact that the defendant, should he escape from the custody of the uh, deputies, would not be nearly as identifiable in civilian clothes as he would be in the orange uh, jail uniform. Under the facts of this particular case, the extension of the right to wear civilian clothes is not warranted because in this particular case, there has already been uh, allegedly an example of the student's uh, dangerousness uh, with regard to the alleged attack on the deputy at the jail. So there is some rational support for Commander Minot's uh, evaluation that this particular defendant who has exhibited high risk behavior and poses a higher than usual safety risk to the deputies, the court, and anyone else involved in the pretrial proceedings. Still with us, Chris Ann Hall. I want to go quickly through what the judge ruled in this case. Number one, he denied the request to be in clothes that were civilian clothes because of the safety risk. Number two, he said there will be a second competency evaluation. In addition, the doctors can have the background information. And the fourth thing that he said was the state gets to pick the doctor. Your thoughts? Right. No, I, I think that's exactly right. Uh, for pretrial hearings, there's no reason for him to be in street clothes. And even though the judge said first and form, you know, first, but not foremost, the imposition and the inconvenience on the jail, um, that really is a kind of a big deal. And it is that inconvenience imposition on the jail that brings about the safety concerns, especially if you have a client that is incompetent or has at least been deemed incompetent by one doctor. There are things in street clothes that people are not allowed to wear in the jail because they could be a safety hazard to themselves or even to someone else. And you don't have the same consideration. The reason people wear street clothes in a jury trial is so that the jury doesn't automatically have a bias against them. And, you know, we just have to point out again, arguments were made. The defendant allegedly attacked a jail deputy while incarcerated. He's serving or uh, pending charges in that case. And I think, Chrisanne, that also adds in in the last 20 seconds to that safety risk factor that the court has to consider. Yes, absolutely. But I think there's one thing that would, makes me curious. Will there be a civil trial against UCCS? for negligence in this dorm room assignment. Yeah, I think that is something that's coming too. We're gonna wait and see. We'll bring any new news on that, obviously. Thank you so much, Chrisanne Hall, for Thank joining you. me this